Munitatul Guzat, Gift of the Warriors of the Faith. Translation by Kurtulus Oztopchu. Voiced by Eleven Labs. A quick note. Oztopku in his translation brackets phrases that do not appear to be included in the original work, mainly to clarify and give the appropriate sentences consistency. Transcribing the sentences to text which can be understood by Eleven Labs, I have decided to include these as part of the translation so that this can be shown as intended. Historical Context Munyatui Guzat is an anonymous 14th century Mamluk Kipchak treatise. According to the treatise, the date given is year 850 after the Hijra of the Prophet, which would make it 1446. It is unique of the time period in that it is written in Kipchak Turkish, with the first two and one half pages and all the chapter titles being in Arabic, and the copy being available in the Top Kapi Sarai Muezesi in Istanbul. According to Ostopcu, neither the copyist nor the translator is known. It was translated from the masterly work of Muhammad ibn Yaqub ibn Ayy Hazam or Hizam, al-Hatali, or Hatli, or Hatbi, entitled Kitab al-Furusiya Valbaitara. MG is the abridged translation of the third and last chapter of this work. The translation was undertaken at the request of a certain Timur Beg, the commander of the Sultan's bodyguards, for the benefit of the Turkish Gazes. The treatise itself is the first Turkic Furusiya manual, which has several implications which is furthered by the writing style of the treatise. Ostopchu provides several findings on this basis. The role of the Mamluks, a large portion being Turkic Kipchak, at the this time who would have been bought to Cairo, alienated from the population and taught military skills, means the role of the Turkic language would have been vital. According to Ostopku, indeed most of the Mamluk works written in Turkish come from the Circassian period, 1382 to 1517. This created the condition for garnering written works in Turkic Kipchak specifically with six surviving Turkic Arabic glossaries. What differs specifically with this treatise is it not only serves as an abridged translation, with sections omitted from Ibn Akihizam's work, but the translator tries to make the text as simple as possible. This coincides with several aspects on the writing quality that Oztopku points out, namely, a. Every point is described very precisely, especially as regards complicated and sometimes very similar lance maneuvers. B. Certain points are repeated several times either in the same or similar ways to make sure that the point is made clear. c. The fact that this is an abridged translated shows that the translator wanted to focus on the most important points. He also wanted to keep the book as short as possible and thus keep the attention of the reader. This goal is mentioned in various parts of the manuscript. d. The importance of learning the basics is frequently repeated. The tricks on the subject are given not only for the reason that they be applied, but the reader will know them, so that his opponent will not be able to apply these tricks to him. E. The manuscript was read again after it was finished, probably by the same person, and the same pen introduced corrections. However, since this is a very clean copy, there is no evidence that it was used as a manual during actual practice. Ostopsu doesn't seem to provide a contextual reason as to why this is the case, so perhaps I may contribute in providing a historical context and reason consisting of two facets. The first is related to structure of the Mamluk Sultanate itself, between 1250 to 1517, which became volatile as the political system began to deteriorate of its own accord. Since the Mamluk institution began in the Abbasid Caliphate, with some preceding elements before, the result of buying these slaves, training them in a land where they were alien to the population, and then manumitting them meant the Mamluks would owe their allegiance solely to their Mamitter. According to David Ayalon, this in the Mamluks Sultanate, instilled in the Mamluk a feeling of profound loyalty towards his master and liberator, Ustad, on the one hand, and for his fellows in servitude and liberation, Kushdashia or Kushdashin, singular. Kushdash, on the other dot dot dot. The Sultan and his Mamluks formed a tightly knit association whose members were united by strong bonds of solidarity. There existed between the Sultan and his Mamluks a sort of double bond. They were in power only so long as he ruled, and he ruled only so long as his power was based on them. In addition, the Sultan buttressed his power by appointing his own Kushdashia to high positions, and similarly, during the Circassian period, by appointing his blood relations as well. The administration of the Mamluks, in association with the Sultan, who was currently in power, 
meant that when a new sultan came to the throne, there would be systematic purge and suppression of the administration who would remove the Mushtarawat, Mamluks of the ruling sultan, and officers whose proximity to the sultan made them the most powerful group. This was not limited to removal from positions but imprisonment and exile, mainly of chiefs and leaders, or transfer to the service of the emirs. Though known before, this became the norm in from the middle of the 13th century onwards and would be used gradually as not to disrupt the system or create a void of experienced personnel with a gradual promotion of the new sultan's mamluks to positions, moving the promotions eventually from lower to higher ranks. However, this became exacerbated as both the Mamluk system and the economy began to decline in the Circassian period. With the violent nature and the constant overthrow of Mamluk sultans, the previous administration would be weakened and the new sultan would increase the number of Mamluks under him in the shortest possible time. By the late medieval period, purges could include the killing and imprisonment of rivals and the torturing to death of many Mamluks not in service. In some cases, these Mamluks were bribed or simply thrown out into the population. Military training of these Mamluks became negligent and cowardly. The constant turnover of Mamluks with the new administration effectively degraded the entire system, creating a lack of experienced officers and warriors. This would explain both the transition of the treatise to Turkic Kipchak and the simplification of the text. With every new administration, there is insufficient time to adequately train new Mamluks. This coincides with the need to train Mamluks in a short period of time, making the language quick and easy to learn. Indeed, the treatise represents a degrading in the quality of learning that took place from the 14th century and should be seen as a simplified version. The second is one of the ways in which Furusiya literature came to be transmitted by the late medieval period due the difficulties created by the first facet. This falls under the third group of Furusiya literature that is categorized by Shihab al Saraf which, according to him, encompasses popular and often apocryphal literature produced to meet the great demand for Furusiya, works at the end of the Bari period and throughout the Circassian period. Much of it consists of truncated and sometimes amalgamated portions of pre-Mamluk and Mamluk treatises from the previous two groups. The copyists and booksellers, who played a great role in propagating these works, either deliberately left them anonymous or attributed them to well-known authors from Category 2. The two facets provide a point of necessity in the Mamluk Sultanate, which is a reflection on having to deal with a particularly diminishing time in which basic steps are taught in a repetitive manner, as a tool in fighting someone who is not acquainted with Mamluk warfare. Introduction In the name of God, the Merciful, the Compassionate. Thanks be to God who granted the Muslims supremacy over the infidels and despots, who raise their value and their standard over that of the rebels and those who are indecent by blessing them with various kinds of horses and saddle animals, and who taught them the art of using arms, and blessing upon our Lord Muhammad, the last of the prophets and the messenger of the God of the universe, who sent him to call unto God by his permission as a warner, and revealed the clear book to him, so that the universe might be granted salvation. Whosoever perished might perish by a clear sign, and by a clear sign he might live who lived and ordered him to fight against whosoever disagreed with him or disobeyed him through a firm speech in the perfect book. God the Most High said, O prophet, struggle with the unbelievers and hypocrites, and be thou harsh with them. Their refuge is hell and evil homecoming. Peace be upon his, Muhammad's, family and his companions, the good and pure people. O Lord of all being, we pray you to bring victory to Muslim armies, scouts, and frontier soldiers wherever they settle, whether in the eastern part of the world or in the western, and grant them great victory. Make things easy for them, and do not let the infidels gain advantage over the believers. But now let us turn to our topic. Know that the reason for the composing this treatise in the Turkish language was that, at God's command, a most glorious sovereign appeared in the land of Egypt. He is like the moon in beauty, like Umar in grandeur. He resembles Ali in bravery. He surpasses Hatim in generosity. He is a master in the art of horsemanship and is well endowed with excellent qualities. He holds scholars in esteem. He wields the sword for the sake of Muhammad's law. He risks his life for God's command. He becomes a means by which the oppressed obtain justice. He bestows favors upon the craftsmen who are so important for the Muslim community. 
This paragon of virtue is Tamir Beg, commander of the Sultan's bodyguards. May he live in continuous happiness and good fortune for many years in the way of Muhammad and his house. Young and old, those who were his intimate friends as well as those who did not know him well, all turned to this eminent person. Oh, how many needy people he assisted! Oh, for how many people without provisions did he become a means of sustenance! In praise of this sovereign the poet writes, Poem. Hark, ye, who in beauty and skill are the lord of the land of prosperity. The sun is filled with desire for you. Your beauty makes the moon ashamed. My lord, through your constant generosity, you have reached this place of happiness. Should he come, only Hatimai Tayil would be equal to you. When you take the lance into your hand, put on your armor, mount your horse, and set up the bow, your enemy will lose all chance of remaining alive. Those slaves who seek to engage you in combat will always get wounded. Then having lost their minds, they walk about taking stock of their wounds. Whoever was worthy reached the post of happiness. According to the legend, he who beheld the phoenix found the kingdom. O oh, preeminent one, may this good fortune remain with you forever. Your generosity makes everyone praise you. My lord, whoever passes by while this composition is being read and understands it, even those who are his enemies, would send their sounds of astonishment to heaven. It became necessary for me, this devoted slave, to have recourse to that high court. Having thought about that, he set out for the presence of that fortunate sovereign. When I, this poor slave, entered the service of this commander of the bodyguards, the preeminent of sovereigns, the latter welcomed this poor slave with all kinds of favors. He then pointed out, in our presence is an Arabic book concerning arms. If you would be good enough to translate it into the Turkish language so that these Turkish warriors for the faith may benefit from it, you may also obtain recompense, he said. This devoted slave, having replied, with the greatest pleasure, carried out his orders, took that Arabic book, and departed. He busied himself with the translation of this book as far as service of the Lord's permitted him. Thanks and gratitude be to God. With God's assistance he translated that book into the Turkish language and named it Munyatul Guzat, Wish of the Warriors of the Faith. Having organized the subject matter as best he could, he composed it into the six basic skills. The first skill, mounting the horse. The second skill, holding the lance. The third skill, the use of the sword. The fourth skill, holding the shield. The fifth skill, archery. The sixth skill, the game of polo. Whosoever has learned these skills well and can use them in time of need will be without equal in the world, and of that there can be no doubt. But my advice is that the horseman should, with sincerity, state his intention to follow in the path of God. He should not draw his sword against the believers, the Orthodox, and the Muslims, nor ever carry out these acts, unless they are in accord with the principles of the Sharia. He should always keep himself in God's service. He should also thank God for bestowing such great skills upon him. Also, he should not be arrogant and proud toward fellow Muslims. He should always be modest and humble toward them. As the messenger, may God commend and salute him, says, God elevates him who humbles himself before God, and God humiliates him who is proud. The first skill, mounting the horse. Mark well, O warrior for the faith, ascetic, champion of Islam that the essence of horsemanship is to acquire a firm seat on the horse. The best kind of having a firm seat is having a firm seat on an Arab horse. If a person cannot have a firm seat on an Arab horse, his riding will neither be firm nor correct. And also when he is trotting his horse, he should always be able to remain firmly seated in his saddle. And when the horse springs up, he will not fall off. I have seen many people who claim to be good horsemen before they had had a firm seat on an Arab horse and thus they fell off their horses in a jousting match. So it became necessary for a horseman to acquire a firm seat on an Arab horse through much practice in riding, which he should never neglect. And also know that another skill essential for good horsemanship is to be able to ride bareback. Learn to ride bareback. Do not be embarrassed when doing so, because sometimes it may be necessary to ride like this. Sometimes your enemy may attack you unexpectedly, and your horse may be without a saddle. If you have mastered how to ride bareback, then when your enemy is upon you, you will mount your horse, taking refuge in God, together with your skill in horsemanship, and defeat your enemy. Beware, do not neglect to practice. 
Master this skill bareback riding, through much practice in ridding. This is one of the valuable skills which many horsemen do not know. Then purchase a saddle made of strong wood, the seat of which is wide, and the two pommels of which are not so large that should the horse suddenly spring up, the front pommel will strike the horseman's chest and hurt him. Furthermore, the horseman does not look good in such a saddle. He sinks into it. Moreover, the straps of the stirrups should be strong. The stirrups should also be heavy, so that when desired, one's feet will find them quickly. And there should be some projections along the bottom part of the stirrup so that when the horse springs up, the stirrup will not slip off the rider's foot. And one stirrup should not be heavier than the other. They should be of equal weight. Also, both stirrup straps should be as long as the legs of the rider. They should be neither longer or shorter than the rider's legs, but better long than short, because if they are short, when the rider pulls on the rein of his horse while riding he may fall from the saddle. Also, when the horse springs up, he the rider may lose his seat. Also, his knees may bend and go forward while his feet remain behind his knees. Also, when the horse springs up, the rear pommel of the saddle may break. Thus it is obvious that a long stirrup strap is better than a short one. Then make a square saddle blanket out of good felt and make sure that the stuffing for it is very soft, or make a round saddle blanket with the same features, and take some strong girths. Use two of them, for in my view two girths are better than one and are more secure. When you tighten all of these as I have described, under you and the horse, then have your horse saddled, but tighten the girths with your own hands. If you find your horse already saddled, mount it carefully watching the girths so that the saddle will not rise. When you want to mount the horse, stand on the left side of it, Hold your whip in your left hand at the same level as the stirrup or a little behind it and then mount the horse. Then open your coat and arrange it, and then hold the bridle reins in your left hand together with the mane of the horse. If the horse does not have a mane, then hold on to the inside of the front pommel of the saddle. Then twist your stirrup forward once. After that, put your left foot on the stirrup, but be careful not to let your foot go into the horse's elbow. Then holding the front pommel of the saddle with your right hand. Mount it gently but with strength and skill. When you sit in the saddle, put your right foot on the right stirrup as you placed your left foot on the left one. Then arrange your clothes. If you wish, arrange them before getting on the saddle as some horsemen do, but in my view that is not good. The better one is this, that you should hold onto the bridle reins together with the front pommel of the saddle until you mount the horse and are firmly seated upon the saddle. Then, arrange your clothes. And while mounting, you should shorten the bridle reins a little on the right side so that the stirrup will not be too far from the side of the horse. If the horse turns around, the stirrup will come closer to you. If you wish to mount while holding on to the rear pommel of the saddle with your right hand, do so. Everyone regards this as correct. However, in my view, it is better to mount the horse while holding on to the front pommel of the saddle with the right hand because if the horse suddenly springs up while you are mounting it and your right hand is on the front pommel, you will not fail to get on. If your right hand is on the back pommel, it is to be feared that if the horse springs up, you will not be able to mount it. And after you have mounted the horse completely, pull on the bridle reins and thus straighten the horse's head. And know that the essence of good horsemanship is to hold the bridle reins properly, to have a firm seat, and also labaka. That means the graceful movements of the horseman holding his body straight while sitting properly in the saddle, having a perfect position with his feet. As for sitting in the saddle properly, that means sitting upright, holding your body straight, so that your body will never be bent, and you should put your feet in the stirrup towards the front, sideways, without sticking your chest out too far, and then ride your horse at a walk in the hippodrome by giving a signal to your horse with your heel. Do not ride out bent forward and by shaking your hands. Also. In that position, do not ride out moving both your feet vigorously and kicking your horse in the belly, because to do so is unseemly. Good horsemen do not behave in that manner. They set out with only a small signal. Then ride your horse at a slow walk slowly. Proceed as I indicated in the chapter on sitting properly on the horse. So hold your shoulders and your back straight as I have stated, because God the Most High created you absolutely straight. Neither lean forward nor backward. Also. Keep your seat, i.e., buttocks, firmly in the saddle, and press your thighs firmly against the saddle. Keep your feet firmly on the stirrups. 
hold your heel rather low and watch your feet when they are in the stirrups, so that they will not tremble once your feet are in them. The upper front part of your feet should not be away from the stirrups. Also, do not hold your feet too far forward or backward. Hold them in the middle, because there is nothing worse for a horseman than to hold his feet too far back and his heel too high, and that is all there is to it. Uh, when you have perfected all these that I have indicated to you, and have made it second nature, and when these will also become your habits in slow walk, and when you have perfected your riding in the manner that I have explained to you, you will not move except with skill, and then turn your horse to trotting with a signal of the spur as I have described. Then trot your horse on, and take care and sit firmly in the saddle, as I have already advised you because trotting is difficult, it almost forces the horseman out of his saddle. When you reach perfection, at this as I have described to you, then giving the horse reins, ride out your horse, at an easy gallop in a straight line, and then turn to your left side in a circle slowly as I have described. And the diameter of your circle should be between 70 and 80 zeros. When the diameter of your circle is wide, it is easy for both the horse and the horseman to turn. It is also better to gallop the horse. No matter how intelligent the horse is, he gets confused when the diameter of the circle is too narrow. A horse which is not intelligent is of no value. Such a horse walks on the edge of his hoof and may either drag his hoofs or take a wrong step. Good horsemen do not use a narrow circle and do not turn suddenly except with determination when the need arises. The proper circle is such that you should revolve on the circle very evenly. When you return, you should return on the same track. When you wish to return, go a bit outside of the track of your circle as much as will enable you to return and enter your track slowly. This way is quicker to return. The necessity for such a turn is that you and your horse will become accustomed to this, and so that you will always have a large nook arm, that is to say, riding in a circle in a hippodrome. Another aspect is that you should circle to your left at the nook arm. When you wish to turn, you should make your turn inside the circle. Such a turn is appropriate in narrow places, in narrow hippodromes, and when people form a circle around you. Then return to practice, i.e., circling around. When you have finished circling to your left three times, turn your horse toward its right side. Circle on that pattern three times. Then turn it, i.e., the horse, to its left. Circle once, then turn it to the right. Circle once on that pattern too. Then when you turn, make your horse go a little faster by spurring him on. And then circle once toward its right side and once to its left side. Then leave the circle as if you were going out straight ahead. Make a half circle. Then turn your horse toward one direction and make a half circle. Make this circle the same size as the hippodrome so that it will be useful both to attack and to retreat. Then stop your horse. Pause and remain silent for a while so that your horse may catch its breath and rest. Each time you ride him, make it a habit to stop your horse and wait so that your horse may catch his breath and be comfortable. Then arrange your clothes and your equipment, and ride your horse fast, but do not ride too long. Those horses which are used in jousting matches are soon worn out by long, uninterrupted riding. Then pull back on the bridle rein slowly three times, then let them go, but hold on to them the fourth time. Do not pull toward any one side. Take care not to make your horse bleed by pulling too hard on the bit, because in my opinion there is no mistake worse than when a horseman causes his horse to bleed at any time, except during a battle or if no old wound is present. To do so is a great mistake. Know that no one causes a sound horse to bleed except those with no skill in horsemanship. When you become skilled in all these matters which I have explained to you, and if they have become your habits, then you will make no movement in riding without wisdom. When you unwittingly make a mistake, or if you are preoccupied, your skillful riding and maneuvers will not change for the worse. Then after that, turn your attention to matters related to horsemanship and understand the art of horsemanship well, until you have mastered this, since horsemen defeat their enemies in this way. The good student is he who considers these matters thoroughly and he searches into those things that I have described to you before, and he should be patient in carrying them out until he learns them fully and they stay in his mind permanently. He who has begun to learn our science and finds it difficult and cannot grasp it at first, should not get depressed, since in the beginning all sciences are difficult. This science in particular is more difficult than all the other sciences, because so many sciences and crafts are gathered in it. The master of this science needs to keep many things in his mind, in particular when he engages his opponent, 
he needs to protect himself on the back of the horse, to ride gracefully, to hold the bridle reins properly, to keep his opponent under control, to be careful with the head of his lance, as well as many other things. If this horseman is not intelligent and brave, he cannot master these things. That is why I have said that a horseman needs to be skilled in riding well, having a firm seat, and in holding on to the bridle reins properly, and all these procedures should be second nature to him. It is not possible for a person when learning to keep two things in mind at once, especially things such as these. When these things which I have said have become second nature to you, you will not need to think about them at that time. When you have gathered all these skills, do not become arrogant and seek to knock down your opponent, seek rather to protect yourself. There is no doubt that it is better to protect yourself than to seek to knock down the opponent. Whenever you are concerned about knocking down your opponent, you will surely get thrust. Learn these things and thank God. Thank God for what God, the Most High and the Most Exalted, has given to you, since one must always thank anyone who has bestowed a benefit upon you. The second skill, holding the lance, a chapter on the old Khorasan style of tilting. The old Khorasan style of tilting is performed by holding the bridle reins in the left hand, together with the lance at a distance of one arshin from the head. Your hand should be under the bridle reins. Hold it pressing against the shoulder blade of the horse. And with your right hand, hold the butt of the lance, leaving a distance of about four fingers from the end so that the lance will not go into your sleeve. Also, hold your right hand so that it and the butt of the lance will press against your belt and hold your right wrist and right elbow so that they press against your right side, and stretch your arm out well, and sit on the horse at a slant. Keep the head of the lance close to the left cheek of the horse, and lean on the left stirrup a little, without moving your buttocks from the saddle and the feet from their previous position, until the end of your shoulder and the ear of the horse and the head of the lance are all in one line exactly. If you do not do as I have indicated, your face and chest will be left exposed, Moreover, because of this fault, your opponent's lance will reach you. Pay close attention to these points, for they are of the essence. When you wish to tilt to your right side, hold the lance together with the bridle reins in your right hand, in the same way as you held it in your left. Replace the left with the right, as I have described to you, when you were tilting to your left. Whenever I mention Coruscant style tilting, proceed as I have just described. A second explanation is not required. Thus understand this at this point. Keep it firmly in your mind, do not forget it. Chapter on the New Sagar Style of Tilting The New Sagar Style Tilting is carried out as follows. With your left hand hold the lance at a distance of about four fingers from the butt, together with the bridle reins so that your hand is over the bridle reins. And with your right hand hold the lance toward the upper side at a distance of a little more than one arshin from the head. You should thrust with the lance without stretching your arm out too far. And you should return to tilting quickly. When you do this tilting parallel to the right cheek of your horse, do it by leaning back a little as if you are protecting your face. Do not lean backward too much, for that is a grave error. Tilting to the left side is done in the same way as above. In this book whenever I mention the new Sagar style tilting, do as I have just described. Chapter on the Damascus style tilting, which is an Anatolian style. Damascus style tilting is carried out as follows. Hold the lance with your right hand at a point one arshin from the butt, and press it in toward your armpit and hold it very close to the cheek of the horse. When you wish to tilt to your left side, move the lance over to your left side without moving your right hand from the place on the lance where you had been holding it, having passed it over the horse's head without letting the butt of the lance out of your armpit. If you feel confident of yourself, do exactly the same thing with your left hand that you did with your right. But in my opinion this is very ineffective. With this type of tilting the horsemen trick one another. In this book whenever I say Damascus style tilting do as I have indicated above. But I have seen few people who tilt with their left hands. Everyone performs it with their right hands in the manner I have described to you, unless the horseman is left-handed. But, of these matters only, God knows the truth. A chapter on the Dalem style of tilting, also called the Yaman style. Dalem style tilting is done as follows. With your right hand, hold the lance at a point three arshins from the butt. You should hold the lance with your palm under it. The lance should be held so that it is resting on your right wrist. This chapter is very slight. And that is that.
a chapter on the transfer in the old Khorasan style of tilting while riding. The transfer in the old Khorasan style while tilting together with bridle reins is done as follows. While you are tilting to your left, if you wish to transfer your lance over the head of the horse as I have described to you, remove your right hand from the butt of the lance and have the butt of the lance pass by in front of you, and you should support it with the wrist of your left arm so that it will be firm. Do not let the head fall down to the ground. Then move over the head of the lance to the side of the horse, then taking hold of the bridle reins with your right hand, hold the places that you held with your left hand. Then, sliding your left hand down, take hold of the place where your right hand was earlier, then press your left arm together with the lance to the belt on your left side. If you wish to turn the lance to your left, turn it as you did to your right side. Wherever in this book I mention Coruscant-style transfer, while performing Coruscant-style tilting, do as I have just indicated. But only God knows the truth. A chapter on the new Sagar style transfer. Whenever you wish to carry out a new Sagar style transfer while you are performing the Khorasan style tilting, push the lance with your right hand, having loosened your left hand on it a little, in order that the lance will move freely so that the butt of the lance will be in your left hand together with the bridle reins. Then move the head of the lance to the right side of the horse. Then take the bridle reins into your right hand and hold it at exactly the same place where you held it with your left hand and then tilt to your left. If you also wish to transfer, do as I indicated. Whenever you wish to transfer to your left when performing the new Sagar style, tilting, slide your right hand down until it reaches your left hand. Then, take the bridle reins from your right hand with your left hand below the lance. Then move the head of the lance to the left side of the horse. Whenever you wish to transfer to your right, hold the lance with your left hand as you did with your right hand. This is the Sagar style transfer. In this book, wherever I mention to you transfer in the new Sagar style, proceed as I have just indicated. And know that in my opinion, this transfer and tilting is the best of the techniques. In this way, I, the poor slave of God, fight against other horsemen with the help of God. God is the one who helps and brings good luck. A chapter on transfer in the Damascus style. There is no transfer in the Damascus style, but the transfer in this style is carried out by moving the head of the lance either to the left side or to the right side of the horse, without removing the butt of the lance from your armpit. Upon you be peace, and God is the one to seek aid from. A chapter on carrying out the transfer from the Damascus style to the Sagar style. To transfer from the Damascus style to the Sagar style is as follows. Remove the butt of the lance from your armpit. Then, taking at the butt of the lance in your left hand, Take the bridle reins in your right hand without moving it from its place. Then tilt in the new Sagar style, for this is an effective transfer. Knowledge is good and ignorance is bad. A chapter on taking up the lance and the science of using the lance. When you wish to learn the science of using the lance, you should select a good horse, that is, one the legs of which are strong, which is well built and obedient, and which is not hot tempered or a balker and it should be fleet and should not be unruly, because it is easy to train horses with these characteristics. And then tighten your equipment, especially your girth. Do not entrust that task to anyone. Tighten it with your own hands. If somebody else has tightened it, be careful when you are mounting. Then pull up tight on the bridle reins until they come close to the saddle bow. Then tuck your skirt into your belt from behind. If you wish, Sew a button on the lining of your garment and make a buttonhole on the corresponding place. Button up after you have mounted. All good horsemen do this. But I regard it unseemly to tuck the skirt into the belt, and that is that. And the lance should be of medium size in thickness, because if it is thick, it will not easily remain in one's hand. And also the fingers will not grasp tightly around it. No matter how strong you are, let your lance be as light as possible because a light lance with defects is still better than a heavy lance without them. If you are strong and able to wield a heavy lance, you will still do better with a light one, and you will be able to perform with it as you wish. No matter how strong you are, make your weapon as light as possible, especially your lance, and that is that. And in time of combat, use a lance ten arshins long. If it is shorter, it is also permitted. And then grasp your whip in the fingers of your left hand. Make your whip four hand spans long. Make the strap of the whip weak, because sometimes a foot soldier takes hold of the horseman's whip and pulls down upon it. If the strap is strong, it is to be feared that the horseman will fall down. 
If it the strap is weak, it will break, and that person will become distracted with it, so the horseman will do whatever he wishes. If you intend to learn these maneuvers that I have mentioned to you, practice them often until they become second nature to you. Uh when you are able to carry out the maneuvers that I have described to you, then take the lance in your hand and with your right hand hold the lance in the middle on your right side so that your right hand and the lance will be behind your right thigh on the same level with the pommel of the saddle, and hold the head of the lance upward and at the same level as the right ear of the horse, and take care that the butt of the lance doesn't touch the ground. The distance between the ground and the lance should be more than one arshin. After doing so, go out and ride your horse slowly in a circle so that its left side is toward the center, and complete a wide circle, as I have indicated its limit to you. Without haste, Circle in a slow trot. Circle twice in this manner. After that, move the head of the lance over to the left side of the horse. Then, with your left hand, hold it where you held it, with your right hand crosswise together with the bridle reins. The head of the lance should be on a level with the left stirrup. Then raise both ends of the lance equally. After that, stretch out your right hand. Take hold of the lower end of the lance at the place behind your right thigh on the same level as the rear pommel of the saddle. Circle twice in this position. Then raise your right hand above your head. With a graceful gesture, raise it over your left arm. And with your right hand, take hold of the upper end of the lance at the place you previously held it with your left hand. Then, in this manner, make one circle. After that, raise the lance with your hand over your head, then rotate it to your left once until the head of the lance reaches your right side. Your hand should be on the lower end of the lance and hold the lance across and lower the head a little more so that both ends of the lance are in one line with the two stirrups. Perform all these movements while you are circling towards the left side of the horse. In this fashion, complete one circle. After that, move the butt of the lance over your head until it is over your right arm and its point is level with the right cheek of your horse. In this fashion, also complete a circle. Then thrust your lance forward and tilt to your left in the Khorasan style and then circle twice. Then transfer your lance in the Khorasan style over the head of the horse. Then transfer the bridle reins. In every transfer and change, turn your horse in the same direction. Then tilt the lance to your right, turn your horse around, and take him out of the circle. Transfer to your right side and then circle twice in this way. Then return your lance to the defense. Returning your horse to the right, defend to your left, and turn your horse quickly to your left side until the head of the lance points toward the inside of the circle and your horse will return. In that way. In this way also circle twice. Then turn the lance to the tilting position and perform the tilting. In every maneuver of tilting and defense the head of the lance should point toward the inside of the circle. And the horse should circle in the direction at which the lance points. Then lead your horse straight ahead, about half the length of the hippodrome, tilting the lance directly to your left. Then hold the lance loosely in your left hand, Raise its head upward as far as half the length of the lance until it moves in your hand like water. And stop your horse and your lance all at once. Holding the lance crosswise, walk your horse slowly until you come to your place. If you wish to slide your lance freely backwards, never return it by pulling it repeatedly with your right hand when the lance is in your left hand. This is a grave mistake, and it is inappropriate according to the expert horseman. Rather do as I told you earlier. A chapter on another introduction. Another introduction is done by holding your bridle reins with your left hand and taking the head of the lance into your right hand and holding it behind your right thigh. You should drag it on the ground. Then you should ride out on horseback and trot about half the length of the hippodrome until you are well away from other people. It is good to practice this, since if you make a mistake, it will be unobserved. Then lead your horse at an easy gallop and circle to its left side twice. Then with your right hand move the lance over your head from behind to your left side as you transferred at defense. Then grasp the head of the lance with your left hand and hold the bridle reins with your right. Then turn your horse towards its right side. As you transfer the lance to your left side, hold your left hand with the head of the lance behind your right thigh and drag its butt as you did with your right hand. Circle twice like this. Then with your right hand transfer the lance over your head to your right side. Then hold it with your right hand as you held it before. Then turn your horse. Also circle twice to your left side as you transfer the lance. Then transfer the lance with your right hand so that it comes to your left side and do Khorasan-style tilting with its butt. 
holding it on a level with the left cheek of your horse. Circle once. Then let the lance move freely to your right side until its butt is in your left hand, together with the bridle reins. Its head should point to the back, so that you can defend with it. Circle also once in this position. Then return the lance from the defense with your right hand, move it forward until it passes over the left ear of your horse quickly, and tilt in the Khorasan style over the left ear of the horse. Do this while you are circling. Circle once like that. Then transfer in the Khorasan style over the head of the horse together with the bridle reins, and turn the head of the horse to your right as you transfer. Then move the lance freely backward and defend to your right as you defended to your left. Then return the lance forward and tilt to your left in the Khorasan style. Then turn the lance in your left arm to the half length and stop your horse and lance all at once. But God knows better. A chapter on another introduction. The third introduction is performed by holding the lance and the bridle reins in your left hand. You should hold the head of the lance with your right hand dragging its butt on the ground. Then circle to your left side twice. Then raising your hand together with the lance, put it on your left shoulder, so that the butt of the lance will point to the left front. And turn a little in the saddle until the butt of the lance is close to the head of the horse. Also circle twice like this. Then pass its butt over the head of the horse to the right side without removing the lance from above your left shoulder. Then release the head of the lance from your hand. Let it rotate over your neck and hold it with your right hand. Then hold it in the middle. Then make it rotate twice over your head and place it on your right arm. After that place it over your left shoulder and make it rotate over your neck. Then grab it quickly with your right hand and rotate it twice. Then rotate it with your right hand over the breastband of your horse and with your left hand seize it quickly. Then take the lance into your right hand and rotate it twice over your head until it is over your arm. Then turn it around your waist and under your thigh. Then stretching the lance out to the right and to the left. Tilt and defend. God grants sufficiency to people who entrust themselves to Him, according to what a group of horsemen have said. That is to say, the horsemen of former times have said, that for a horseman to fall down from his horse, or to drop his lance or weapon from his hand, is not a fault. The fault is for him to sit on his horse badly, not to be able to have a firm seat on the horse, to show lack of skill, to make too many mistakes, and to demonstrate little expertise in horsemanship. They, expert horsemen, claimed these as being the sign and good qualities as well as the perfect position of the extremities of a horseman. That is to say, jousting while sitting on the horse absolutely straight, without bending down, and without making any unnecessary moves. In my view, these are as they claimed, but a horseman's being struck is the greatest fault and the most disgraceful. That is to say, there is no greater mistake than this. That is why, when those horsemen who claim to be good are struck, their grief is greater than the grief of those who are struck without claiming to be good. An Introductory Chapter on Engaging the Opponent in Battles this is a chapter on engaging an opponent in a battle. Know that everyone, be he close to you or distant, your friend or enemy, when he engages you in a joust or a battle, seeks to be victorious over you. So you must never be heedless, idle or scared. Because if you are, and if he beats you and thrusts at you, people will not think that you let him defeat you. Such a defeat is always mentioned among horsemen with the word so and so is defeated. So open your eyes and perform well. Being alert is better than trying to strike your opponent. Thus my advice to you is that you not perform in battle on a horse that is not a good one, unless absolutely necessary. There are many horses which are not good for riding in battle. These are unruly, biting, balking, easily scared, and one-eyed horses. It is said that fighting on these is not good. You should not perform in hippodromes, rings, and before sovereigns, unless you are on a horse which is trustworthy, has been tested, and is fleet, light, and calm. It should not be unruly. After mounting the horse, you should arrange your equipment, clothes, and accessories. If these are prepared, fight. If not, do not attack anybody. If your opponent's lance is longer than yours, have it cut off, do not be ashamed to insist on this. If it is shorter than yours, do not let your opponent know it. Know that if, knowing all of these things, you engage your opponent and are struck, the excuses you make regarding your horse, equipment, or lance will not be accepted, and shame and disgrace will become attached to your name. The horseman needs to ride the horse on which he is going to fight for some time until he and the horse become accustomed to each other. It is commonly stated that the horseman must know the qualities of a horse that is good for jousting because there are many necessary qualities which do not exist in all horses. 
Heed these counsels of mine. In this connection I have seen many people who brought up such excuses when they were lanced. They the horsemen were not excused. So keep your eyes open, do not be heedless. It is better for them to say, in time of combat, he ran away without engaging in combat, rather than, he was lanced and beaten. If you are prepared, fight. If you are not, do not. When you wish to engage in a joust with another horseman, as soon as you are on a good horse whose qualities as I have described above, and have the lance in your hand, compare your lance with his on a flat ground. Prepare your clothes and tighten all of your equipment. Pull in on your bridle reins, stand at a sight 200 arshins away from your opponent. Holding your lance at your right side crosswise and raising its head a little bit upward, sit upright in your saddle, not in a bent position. And look at your opponent fiercely and agitate your horse, so that your opponent will be intimidated by you as if you would snatch him from his saddle. Then ride swiftly across the hippodrome to a place at a distance of more than 50 arshins. When you turn, face your opponent, do not turn your back to him. Whatever your position, do not remove the head of your lance away from your opponent's face, with the fierceness that you have displayed to your opponent. Gallop your horse on the same line that you rode before. Ride several times around the circle, then stop and look at your opponent to see what he is doing, how he is standing on his feet, how he is sitting on his horse, and how he is holding the bridle reins. It will be obvious to you if he is alert and skilled in these matters. It will also be obvious if he is pretentious. After that, ride your horse at an easy gallop in the same way that you did before, and give him your opponent the impression that you are approaching him. Then bring your lance forward and tilt to your left side and attack in that way. If he opposes you and you come close to him, riding fast, transfer your lance over the head of your horse. When you come close to him, struggle to take a position behind him quickly. Strive to go behind him. When you are behind him, do not leave him and do not move away from him. If you find an opportunity, thrust at him. If your opponent flees straight ahead and moves out, his back will be left exposed. At that moment thrust at him. If he takes a cut to his right and narrows down your area of movement, in the same way you did when you went behind him, defend to your right, because there is nothing left for you to do except this. Then follow him by going toward his right side. If the area of your movement becomes too narrow for you, turn back and leave the hippodrome. The second time make a surprise attack against him. Then begin your horse's training and drilling and take care that he your opponent will not do to you what you have done to him. After that return and attack him. Catch him off guard with every attack. Holding your lance to your left, charge him. When you come close to him, transfer your lance to your right in the Sagar style and meet him at your right. And do not forget to put your lance on his lance. If that person moves against you, both of your lances will become ineffective. If he discovers your style of charging, then charge him once more but in the following manner. When you come close to him, pretend that you are transferring as you did before, but do not do so. Also bring your horse quite close to him, because he will transfer thinking that you are transferring. Then meet him to your left, since by then you will tilt the lance to your left in the Sagar style. Then you will meet him transferring to his right as before. Thus his left side will remain exposed. If he realizes that and wishes to transfer his lance to his left, he will be engaged in transferring. Thus you will find an opportunity to thrust at him. Many people employ this tactic. Also, learn it well, so that you may always employ it. A chapter on engaging the opponent. This chapter relates how to engage one's opponent in a jousting match. Holding your lance absolutely straight between the two ears of your horse in the Damascus style, attack your opponent. First move in on him. When you have come close to him and see that he has set his lance to his right, set yours to your left. If he has set it, his lance to his left, set yours to your right. And meet him unexpectedly in the Damascus, not in Sagar style of tilting. Holding your lance against your opponent in the Damascus style, quickly charge to your right and to your left. Do it quickly so that your opponent will be surprised, so that he will not know from which side you are going to throw the lance. When you have come close to him, throw the lance on the side not covered by his lance. Beat him thus, but beware that he does not do to you what you are doing to him. Learn these tactics well, do not forget them, if God, may his name be exalted, wills. Another chapter on engaging the opponent. This chapter also relates how to engage in combat with an opponent. You must charge your opponent once to his right, once to his left, then transfer to your right in the Sagar style, and meet your opponent facing you. 
you should stay at a distance from your opponent after you have hit his lance with yours, until he has the impression that this is your style of fighting. As soon as he is under that impression, and he assumes that you will always charge him in this style, then gallop and come closer to him than you did before. Stretch your right hand toward the back, and holding your lance at the butt, come close to him, and strike your opponent on the face or on the chest. In that situation you should make sure not to make any mistakes, because when you strike him, your lance may extend too far. If you do not pull it back quickly, it is to be feared that he will strike you. Thus, do not proceed in this way, until you are certain that you will not make any mistake, and that you will be able to pull your lance, together with the bridle reins quickly, return them to their places, and tilt in the Sager style. Perform this maneuver only after having learned these maneuvers precisely, because in this maneuver there is a great danger. For when he parries your lance, if you are not skillful, it is to be feared that the head of your lance will drop. You will then be exposed and he will thrust at you. So take care that as you strike him, your lance is above his lance. When you catch up with him and thrust at him, guard your horse and yourself very carefully, and turn to your left and pass by him quickly, so that his lance will not reach you, sir, sis. If you are able to reach and thrust at him, with your lance, return your lance quickly to its position, then lean back and hit his lance from below, so that his lance will fall on his neck, then do whatever you wish, and that is that. And know that you should not engage any horseman by going close to him, unless you first calm your horse so that you can proceed as you wish. That is to say, so fight only on a horse that moves as you wish. And it is necessary that when engaging your enemy, before you go close to him, you should cover the exposed parts of your body. Guard the exposed part of your horse and yourself well when you go close to your opponent. This is the essence in every action. Do not forget it, since confidence depends on it in every engagement. God knows the truth better. Another introductory chapter on Sagri style attack. This chapter relates another type of attack against an opponent. Holding the butt of the lance with your right hand, raising its point upward, and putting it over your right shoulder, attack your opponent. If you wish, tilt your lance at a distance, then thrust it toward your opponent. If you wish to confuse your opponent as to which side you will thrust from, watch from which side he thrusts his lance, then thrust yours toward his unprotected side. If he is skillful and he wishes to transfer his lance over the head of the horse quickly and sets it towards you, at that time he will inevitably be surprised and be occupied with the transfer. Try to strike him quickly there, but beware, do not attack when his lance is directed against you, because he also has a lance like yours, and he also has a hand like yours. In the view of experienced horsemen, it is improper if his lance reaches you, your lance reaches him and you strike each other. So, take care not to act in this fashion. If you retreat holding your lance with your left hand, as I have described, and do as you did with your right hand, this is an uncommon maneuver. It is employed rarely. You are employing against your opponent a skill that he has never seen before. Nobody employs it except a person who does unexpected things. Another chapter on Sagar's style of attacking. This chapter also relates how to charge an opponent by holding the lance in the Sagar style. Hold the butt of the lance in your right hand. Raising its head upward, rest the butt on your thigh. Then attack your opponent thus. When you are close to him, thrust your lance into any exposed place. Ended. Still another chapter. And holding the butt of the lance with your right hand, put it on the knot of the breast strap of your horse on the right side. Raising its head upward in the air, attack. When you come close, tilt at whichever side you wish. A chapter on attacking while running. This chapter deals with the following. Hold the head of the lance with your right hand and gallop to the center of the hippodrome. Do this only when you ride out straight ahead, not when you turn. Then return and come close to your opponent galloping. When you approach him and there is still a hundred arshans between you, stretch out your lance, hold it in the middle with your right hand, 48 r as you gallop your horse. Then attack your opponent, tilting the lance. God knows the truth better. Still another chapter on engaging the opponent in combat. This chapter also relates how to engage an opponent in combat. Engage your opponent as I have described before. Tilt your lance toward him in the Khorasan style and be cautious. When you come close to him, signal with the butt of the lance as if you are going to transfer, but do not do so. He will transfer to his right side. 
Turn your horse a little bit to your right, so that you will meet him to his left. Arm, if he is clever, and quickly returns his lance to his left, he will of necessity return it with a transfer. At that time, you find an opportunity so that you can strike him at your right or at your left. If your opponent does not transfer, it is not possible for you to employ this trick against him. Then ride your horse slowly. When he reaches your side, turn toward his rear and make your lance reach your opponent, because he will be in front of you. And if he defends to his left, attack and strike him. He cannot defend to his left no matter how clever he is. God knows the truth better. A chapter on a perfect and rigorous jousting match in a circle. This chapter relates a jousting match in a circle against an opponent. When you go out for a jousting match in a circle with your opponent, either as a pursuer or the one being pursued and see your opponent as a skillful horseman, move yourself from the position of the pursued up to the equal of the opponent. If you are afraid of your opponent, hold the lance and transfer it beside the back sinew of your horse. If you chase the opponent, force him to make a narrow circle and turn to your right side and enter into the circle, then turn to your left. During these two turns, there remains a wide area between the two of you and both of you return to engage each other in the manner that I have described to you. If you are able to thrust at him, do it then. If not, turn towards his back slightly and force him to occupy himself with a transfer so that he will transfer in front of you. Walk your horse gently. Do not pass him. If you do, you will be in front of him or he will confine you and thrust at you. Never attack your opponent when his lance is tilted against you unless your lance is longer than his. Do not attack your opponent, unless you find some parts of his body exposed. If you challenge your opponent in a circle, narrow his area of movement little by little, until you reach him with your lance, if you wish, and if God, the Most High so wills. Be very careful that he does not turn to his right when coming against you, because you will be on his right. In that position employ the Damascus and Sagar techniques. And then there is a new and significant benefit. In these maneuvers, your lance should be inside and your horse should circle in the same direction that the lance is tilted to. When you follow the horseman in the hippodrome, 52 third turn to your right and left. Then employing the Damascus technique, place the opponent opposite you. When you come close to him, hold the lance like a spear. Thrust his face from your right side and hold the upper part of the lance with your right hand. Hit his lance from above. Pull yourself back a little, so that you will be able to gain ground there. Then hold your lance over his lance, slide your lance, and strike him. Without any doubt, he will be struck. Ended. A new benefit similar to the previous one. Some of the horsemen dismount from the horse when they fall in front of their opponent, stand on the ground and meet the opponent with a lance in their hands, and thrust at him in whatever position they like, because a horseman on the ground is more able to thrust than the one who is on horseback. Now let me explain the remedy to you for this problem. When your opponent wishes to dismount, it will be obvious to you because of his movement, since he will need to raise one of his feet and put it on the horse's neck. If one wishes to dismount in order to face the opponent, other than that there is no way to do it. So you watch him. Whenever he raises his right foot and puts it on the horse's neck, you tilt your lance to your left and follow his right side, because he will not have the opportunity to parry your attack. You strike him there at that moment. If he wishes to return his foot back and transfer his lance, he will be occupied with it. Thrust at him in that position. If you thrust at him while his foot is on his horse's neck, you will surely knock him down. If he looks at you at that moment, he himself dismounts from the horse without being thrusted. If he raises his left foot and intends to dismount to his right, you tilt your lance to your right and follow towards his left. Understand these matters well and do not commit an error. If you are able to thrust at him before he dismounts, do it. If he surpasses you in quickness and dismounts before you, look at him when he is about to dismount. If he dismounts to the right side, ride your horse fast and catch up with him, because at the time of dismounting he turns around and inevitably turns his neck towards you. You will find his back exposed to you, thrust at either him or his horse, since he is only strong with his horse. All of the precautions that he has taken will be void. If you can thrust at him then, do it. If not, Stay at a distance. Do not come close. When he wants to mount his horse again, attack him. You will either thrust him down or prevent him from mounting his horse. As long as you stay at a distance, it is not possible for him to mount. If he is the enemy, shoot him with an arrow. Only God knows better. If you challenge a horseman who has a shield on his back, it is not possible for you to thrust at him on the back 
So you thrust at his horse so that when his horse jumps, his shield will be lost. Then you thrust at him at that moment. Know that the shield is not useful, except when the opponent is shooting an arrow at you or throwing a spear at you, before you confront him on horseback in close combat. Once you are in close combat on horseback, the shield becomes a distraction to its possessor, especially to the possessor of the lance. If you abandon the idea of knocking down the opponent alone and wish to knock him down together with his horse, thrust at his horse a couple of times so that his horse will buck. When it raises its rear legs upward, thrust at the rear pommel of his saddle so that he will surely fall down together with his horse. If you wish to knock him down together with his horse without thrusting your lance, hold the tail of his horse while he is riding. Raising upward, pull it very hard so that he will surely fall down. If the opponent chases you, put your lance suddenly between the two front legs of his horse and bend down a little so that he will surely fall down. If you press your horse against his horse's chest, his horse will surely fall down on its face. Another way. And when you fall in front of another horseman in the hippodrome, leave the circle. Exit straight ahead. Expose your back to him and shorten your lance. If he chases you and comes close to you, stretch your lance, turn to your right and stay where you are. Thrust at him if you can, if not, let him come and pass by you. Then you turn your horse's head and follow him. He will be in front of you. When you are pursued, you surely must become the pursuer. When you are in front of the opponent, do not forget to thrust at the chest, face or foreleg of his horse, so that at that time it his horse will stumble, and you will find an opportunity to get him, if God, the Most High, so wills. Another way. When you are in front of the other horsemen, make your circle wide. In every circle, let the track of your circle be wider than the previous one, so that the distance between the two of you will be wide. Then find the middle and enter the circle. Follow the opponent. He will surely be in front of you. If he also turns and attacks you, you also attack him. But this happens very rarely. When he reaches your side, turn towards his back so that he will be in front of you and only God knows the truth better. Another way on a jousting match in a circle. <laughs> when you are pursued and are in front of your opponent, defend with your lance to your left and put your lance on your left wrist. Then hold the rear pommel of your saddle with your right hand. Put your foot on the neck of the horse. When he comes close to you, stay with your horse across. Hold your lance forward and dismount quickly so that you will have time to catch and thrust at him before he flees. Then thrust at him quickly. If he is struck well, he will fall down between you and your horse. Thrust at him if you can, if not, after he passes by you, mount your horse quickly and follow him. If he is smart and protects himself from you and does not let you thrust at him, then thrust at his horse. Whenever you employ this method, it is necessary that you should have a long rope. One end of the rope will be tied to your waist and the other end should be tied to the ring of your bridle rein, so that when you dismount, your horse will not run away from you. Be very careful not to employ this method in the lands of enemy, so that the enemy seeing such skills will not learn them. Also, do not employ these methods against those who have arrows and bow or against friends in the jousting matches. The previous horsemen had employed these methods that were explained in this chapter, and had considered it as an important chapter. They did not offer better methods than those given in this chapter. But I see this method, dismounting from the horse, as inappropriate when one is pursued because the objective of the horseman is to separate his opponent from his horse. When he, the opponent, dismounts from his horse and is on foot by his own wish, that means that the horseman's objective has been achieved. I never employ this method. Before the caliphs, many people have employed this method against me. They could never have their tricks work. They themselves have become the victims of the tricks that they have employed. But in my opinion, the better method is this, that when you are in the battlefield, you should watch your opponent. When you see him employing a certain method, you should force him to change his method from one to the other. Wherever you are afraid of your opponent surpassing you on something, you should try to surpass him on the same thing. The horsemen have said that you should capture your opponent's lance, but I see it as inappropriate most of the time, because you will be overly occupied with it. But when the opponent grabs your lance, do not let it go until he reaches half the length of the lance. If he reaches half the length, let your lance go, turn to your left, and strike with the sword from your right side. Some of the people have said that you should let your lance go as soon as the opponent grabs it, but that is not proper in my opinion, because if you let your lance go as soon as he grabs it, 
and attack him after you let go of your lance. Before you reach him, he will employ a trick against you. But when you go close to him and let go of your lance, you will surprise him, and you can do whatever you wish. If you take away the lance from your opponent and have it, stick it between your thigh and the stirrup strap, and bring its head to the back upwards under your armpit. If not, stick the lance under your right thigh, bring forward its head with its iron part a little more than half the length. If you need to thrust at someone with that, it will be ready for you. If you take the lance of the enemy from his hand, hold the iron part of the lance with your one hand and the wooden part with the other, hit it against the pommel of the saddle and break it, or cut it with the sword. The intention is not to leave it intact. If you wish to take the opponent's lance by pulling it from his hand by force, hold his lance and put it under your armpit. Hold the mane of the horse over the lance tightly together with the lance. With a signal turn your horse to the opposite direction from him, because you can only capture his lance by holding the horse's mane. That is to say, the very objective is to capture the opponent's lance in whatever way it may be. Do not employ this method against the enemy that it is very dangerous, and that is that. A chapter on the horseman's engaging two horsemen. When you engage two horsemen, attack them from the very edge of the hippodrome. If they come against you separately and not together, if they are smart and skillful, they never confront you together, but they will stay apart. For them, there is nothing better to do than this. You also remain far away from them. Then holding your lance in the Sagar style, put it on your shoulder. Its butt should be in your right hand, its head upward. Then in order to pass through them, ride directly towards them, and pass through them. They will be tempted to attack you by thinking, let us attack from both sides. If he throws his lance at one of us, the other one will thrust at him. Strive and pass by them quickly. When you pass by them five arshans, slow down your horse and then gallop. They will have no other choice but to get together, so they will surely get together. Then return towards them and attack whoever is closer to you. One does not need tricks except when one is engaging two horsemen. When they get together, it is as if you are engaging a single horseman. But do not employ this type of a trick unless you are on a very fleet horse, and you know very well that that horse will lead you through them. When you pass through them, place the head of the lance in the direction that you wish to turn. Another chapter on engaging two horsemen, or a group of horsemen. When you engage two or more horsemen, beware that your opponents divide and attack you from both sides. If they come against you as one group, attack whoever is closer to you. Give a signal to one of them as if you are going to attack him and thrust at the other one. If these two horsemen are smart and divide before they attack you, do in the way that I have described to you before. If you run into a group of horsemen, do not run too far from them. Instead, fight with them as you ride along and then run straight ahead in front of them, so that they will be tempted to get you and they will be dispersed and come one by one. Then return towards and attack the one who is coming close to you. If your horse is good, whip it, so that when they see you as such, they will have the temptation to get you, and they also ride their horses whipping. They will come after you one by one, so you will fight with one person at a time. And pay attention not to stay in one place, always move. Let your ambition and mind be after whoever is better equipped with weapons, and has a fleet horse, and is brave. Try to get him. If one of them is equipped with a bow and arrows, first attack the one who has a lance, and protect yourself from the one who has arrows. Do not be careless. If you enter into a narrow place and a horseman catches up with you, dismount quickly and thrust at him. Beware not to thrust at him while you are on horseback, because you may make a mistake, and he will thrust at you instead. But try to employ all of your tricks against this horseman, but dismounting and thrusting at someone while you are on the ground is the best. If you happen to be in a narrow place, and a horseman comes after you, and another horseman appears in front of you. In this position, the maneuver is as follows. You should quickly dismount from your horse, run towards the one who is closer to you and thrust at him. 64R, and at the same time, you should shield your horse against the other one. Do not dismount without tying a long rope to your bridle reins, because if it is tied to some other place, when the horse suddenly runs away or is frightened, it will drag along its owner and knock him down. The enemy will benefit from it. If a horseman finds you in a narrow place, and you regard him as a good horseman, and you think that, you are not as good a horseman as he, and you are afraid of his smartness and horsemanship. If you are close to him, place your lance to defense position, 
without fighting with him and return back galloping to that place, the wide place from where you entered this narrow place, while you sit at a slant in your saddle. Guard yourself against him. Pretend you are riding your horse by pulling on the reins to slow it down. Engage him only after you come out of that narrow place. In my opinion, this is better than to fight in that narrow place. If you run into many horsemen as a group, do not fight with them after you entered into the middle of the group, but rather move at the edge of the group and fight all around the group. If you are equipped with a lance because one who has a lance cannot perform well, in the crowd. Narrow places belong to the one who has a sword, only God knows better. If you are on horseback, run away from a foot soldier as much as possible. Never go near him. Always utilize this principle. And safety in the war is the trick. A chapter on how to free the lance after you thrust with it. This chapter teaches how to free the lance after it has been thrust. It explains that. If you have thrust at the opponent to your left, turn to your right, raise your hand together with the butt of the lance and put it on your shoulder. Then hold it tightly. Turn your face to the left, support it the lance against your horse and pull your lance. If you have thrust the lance to your right, turn to your left and do the same so that your lance will be freed. If you have thrust it into the ground, into a wall or a solid thing, and the iron part of your lance is stuck, and you want to take it out by twisting, if its iron part is twisted, or you are twisted when it is stuck, your lance and its iron part will surely be broken, or its iron part will move and get loose from its wooden part. It is especially difficult to free the lance after you have thrust it into the ground. When you have thrust your lance as such, press it between your saddle and your thigh, turn the head of the horse, and pull at the lance very hard so that it will come out easily. A chapter on parrying. This chapter relates how to parry with the lance. Some people parry by hitting the lance from below upwards. I never approve of it, and know that parrying is the skill of the lancer in the art of jousting. Always put your lance on top of your opponent's lance, and pay attention not to hit his lance unless your lance is firmly fixed on top of his lance. Only then parry it. Know that in that position, you will never make a mistake. If you make a mistake, your lance will fall down on the ground, and thus you will let him parry you, and you will get thrust. If you tilt your lance to your left in the Sagar style, pay attention not to parry because in that position many mistakes are committed. But fatal is to get rid of the opponent's lance by tackling it with your lance in order to thrust at him. If your opponent parries your lance before you do, pull and bring out your lance from underneath his lance and thrust at him. Because when he parries with his lance, if you pull your lance his lance becomes heavy and falls down on the ground. If he parries your lance from below upwards, conceal your lance, raise it upward so his lance will be raised upwards too. Then attack and thrust at him. One cannot parry the lance in any way in the Damascus style except from below upwards, because the butt of his lance is under his armpit. If you parry his lance from above downwards, his armpit does not allow his lance to fall down. If your opponent comes at you holding his lance in the Damascus steel, be sure not to make any mistake when you parry, because if you make a mistake it is more difficult to bring down your lance from above rather than to bring it upwards from below. If you are afraid of your opponent, set your lance firmly on his lance. Do not parry his lance by pressing it hard, but rather move it by bringing it downwards so that the lances of both of you will, without any doubt, be parried. Always be alert that he might bring out his lance from underneath yours and thrust at you. Take heed of the tricks that I have taught you, so that he will not apply those to you. If you do not have a lance, then parry his lance with a whip. If you do not have a whip, collect your turban in your hand, and parry his lance with it. Always parry his lance no matter how much he thrusts at you. This is an established rule and compare other methods with this. A chapter on spurs and other equipment. This chapter relates the use of the spur and other things. It is better if you put spurs on both your feet. When you spur on your horse, do not spur too hard, but rather rub from both sides gently. Doing this is better and preferable. If you put a spur on only one of your feet, it is also possible, but it is more proper to put it on your right foot, because it does not cause any wound on the horse. The roweled spur that is used by the people of the frontier is not good. It has been said that it ruins the horse. If you wish to mount the horse with a lance in your hand, hold the bridle reins in your left hand together with the saddle bow. Hold the lance in your right hand lower than your height, put its butt beside your foot on your right side. Then shorten the right side of the bridle reins in your hand, 
until the head of your horse leans outward so that it will be easy for you to mount. If your horse turns while you mount, it will come close to you. But do not shorten the bridle reins too much for that it is not good. When you approach the horse in order to mount, stay a little behind the stirrup. Do not go forward for that it is not proper. The horsemen regard it as unseemly. Then put your foot into the stirrup and lean on the lance for support, and then mount. When you go up and mount the horse, you do not need a support. While you mount, rotate your lance over the buttocks of your horse to your right side, and take it in your left hand and hold it together with the bridle reins. Then with your right hand, arrange your clothes and equipment. If you are in a desert where there is no one around you and you are afraid that your horse will struggle to be free, hold your lance with your left hand in the middle together with the mane of your horse, and with the other hand hold the front or the back pommel of the saddle and mount. When you wish to dismount, hold the lance upright in your left hand together with the bridle reins on the left side of the horse, and hold the pommel of the saddle with your right hand. Dismount. When you dismount, Take the lance in your right hand, so that your horse by an unexpected turn will not break it, or so that it will not injure anybody. Now mark these well. If your lance falls to the ground, do not try to pick it up while you are on horseback because that is risky. In such a situation, dismount, pick up your lance, and mount again. If God, the Most High, so wills. A chapter on using the lance with a banner which has a benefit. This chapter relates the use of the lance with a banner. Take the lance with a banner, hold it in the middle, rotate it over your head. After holding it across, start lance maneuvers as much as you are able to. And beware that the banner does not wrap around your face or your horse's face, since the wind unexpectedly may catch it. In the opinion of horsemen, this is bad because, while the horseman is busy with getting rid of it, the banner, his opponent defeats him. And only God knows better. Then take your horse out to the tilting exercises. Circle your horse to your left while holding the banner to your right, and circle your horse to your right while holding the banner to your left. Then tilt and defend with your lance. Beware of the direction and the strength of the wind during these maneuvers. If the wind is more powerful than you, place the lance on your shoulder. When you fight with the lance that has a banner, employ a trick. Put the banner against your opponent from the direction of the wind. It makes him blind, and he becomes occupied with it, or put it against his horse's face, and the wind presses it on its face, and you can do whatever you wish. If he is the enemy, put it against his face. If the wind is blowing towards him, then attack him and strike him with a sword. And that is that. A chapter on picking up the burkas from the ground by a lance. This chapter relates how to pick up the burkas from the ground by lance. Make a ring out of reed like a burkas without a foot. Then put on it a dress made out of dark leather or white hide on each one, and put it in the center of the hippodrome. Then ride your horse, come and thrust each one from beneath upwards with the iron part of the lance in each of the five places. Placing a piece of cloth and thrusting it is also like this. Take the first one and raise it upward and then thrust the other one. If God, the Most High, so wills. And that is that. A chapter on tricks with lances. This chapter relates tricks concerning the lance. Know that after the horsemen have excelled in the art of jousting, they also have employed tricks. When you wish to engage an opponent in a jousting match, know the length of the opponent's lance. Then prepare a lance which is longer than that of his lance, and send it with somebody who does not show it to anyone. Let him put it at one end of the hippodrome, in a place that you know. When they measure your lances and cut off the extra length, Go towards that lance which was previously hidden as if you are galloping your horse. Then dismount your horse, as if you are adjusting your girth or checking out your equipment. Put down the lance in your hand and pick up the other lance and mount your horse again. But it is necessary that these two lances are similar in thickness and color. Then ride your horse, come and attack your opponent without stopping. If that person is able to take the other lance away and bury it in the earth at night, let him do it. That is also proper but one must be smart and agile in order to successfully employ these tricks, so that he will be able to do them in secrecy. Also another way in tricks. Another trick is as follows. Prepare a lance out of a suitable tree. Then carve a hole inside or empty the joints of a bamboo lance. Then fill them with soft sand. And stuff its butt with clay or something else that will not fall unless it is pulled and make it firm. Then take a thick lance that is extremely heavy. Bring both of them to the hippodrome and let your opponent choose one of them. He will surely choose the light one. 
you will end up with the one that has sand in it. Then hit its butt on the ground until the clay drops out and the sand pours out. After that, do whatever you wish. Also, another way in tricks. Another trick is as follows. Prepare a lance out of a suitable tree. Then carve a hole inside or empty the joints of a bamboo lance. Then fill them with soft sand. And stuff its butt with clay or something else that will not fall unless it is pulled and make it firm. Then take a thick lance that is extremely heavy. Bring both of them to the hippodrome and let your opponent choose one of them. He will surely choose the light one. You will end up with the one that has sand in it. Then hit its butt on the ground until the clay drops out and the sand pours out. After that, do whatever you wish. A chapter on carrying the lance on trips. This chapter relates how to carry the lance on trips. On trips, hold the lance in the middle together with the bridle reins and put a portion of it on your right thigh in such a way that its head is directed forwards. If you wish, hold its butt with your right hand and have its head directed upwards, put it on your shoulder. If you wish, do it like that also with your left hand. If you wish, hold it upright and putting its butt on your thigh or on your saddle. Or if you wish, stick its butt into the stirrup and make it firm. Know that there is no preference as to how to carry the lance. Whatever method is good and easy for the horseman, let him carry the lance in that way. If you are in a safe place or if you wish to enter into narrow places, have the head of your lance together with its banner pointed backwards and enter. If you are in the land of the enemy, have it pointed forwards and then enter, and be careful that its head will not thrust into a wall or a tree and be broken. And sometimes the horseman carries the lance without being in need of these practices. This is how. He should make a hole in the butt of the lance and tie it with a rope, forming it like a round ball. Or he makes a hole through a bone or a knuckle bone and ties it to the lance and thrusts it into his belt and he drags its head on the ground backwards. Or he makes a wide ring out of that rope and puts it on his right arm. This is good when one is shooting arrows. Do whichever is easy for you. A chapter on the colors of the lances. This chapter relates the colors of lances. The most beautiful color for a lance is yellow, and the remaining colors are also good, but the color black is not good. And that is that. A chapter on the rare qualities of lances. This chapter relates the best lances. The best lance should be thick and plump. Its bark should be soft and smooth. Because if it is hard and very dry, when it stays under the rain and sunshine, it will not endure. It will be mufaraz. That is to say it will be cracked, it will split. And only God knows better. It is also necessary that the lance should be round. Its center should be strong, so that when one shakes it, it does not vibrate too much. Its head should not be very thin. It should be of medium size. It should be well grown. Its joints should be circular and ringed, and its knots should not be hollow. It should not have knife marks. Note that in my opinion, the best and strongest lance is the one with brown color. Because bamboo with that color grows on high grounds and rain and sunshine reach it. If it has a flaw, it becomes immediately apparent. One does not need to be cautious with lances of this color, but yellow and white bamboo grow in swamps. Sunshine does not reach it, so if it has a flaw, it does not become apparent. And that is that. It is necessary that the lance not be very thick, so that it should fit into the hand. It should not be very thin. If so, the fingers reach the hand and touch the palm. The longest lance is eleven arshins. The ones that are more than ten arshins have the perfect weight. And only God knows better. A chapter on the lance flaws that do not cause great damage. This chapter relates the lance flaws that do not cause great damage. I have mentioned the colors of lances that are not good in the chapter on the color of lances. Know that the flaw concerning the color of a lance is not a flaw that causes great damage. Its thickness or thinness, whether it grows on the high grounds or in the swamps, those splits that resemble cracks but are not cracks, rather they are joint places, and whether the two ends of a lance are bent inwards or not, all of these are not the flaws that cause damage. And only God knows the truth better. A chapter on the lance flaws that do not cause great damage. This chapter relates the lance flaws that do not cause great damage. I have mentioned the colors of lances that are not good in the chapter on the color of lances. Know that the flaw concerning the color of a lance is not a flaw that causes great damage. Its thickness or thinness, whether it grows on the high grounds or in the swamps, those splits that resemble cracks but are not cracks. Rather, they are joint places. And whether the two ends of a lance are bent inwards or not, 
All of these are not the flaws that cause damage, and only God knows the truth better. The third skill is using the sword. This chapter relates good and bad swords, knowledge of the range of the swords, and that which is the proper length and weight of the swords. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, know that God, the Most High, has taken your side. The third skill chapter relates the usage of the sword. Know that there is no weapon among weapons that is described with such nobility, and that is so valuable that its possessor is proud of it and that achieves victory with it, except the sword, because it has respect and superiority over all the weapons. The people also beat the armies with its name the sword. They say, we conquered it by sword. This is such a weapon that all the people use it. The one who knows how to use it, and the one who does not, young and old, are protected by it everywhere. And it the sword is such a good brother, that it does not become inactive in wide or even in narrow places. One needs it on the sea, and on the land, and in a crowd. On a very windy day, the lance becomes a burden for its possessor, but this, the sword, never becomes useless. And on that day, the archer cannot shoot his arrow straight, therefore no one can do without the sword. No matter how many weapons are at your disposal, you are certain to say, among every class of people, and in every land, there is no weapon other than the sword with which they can always fight, and that weapon is identified with them. Although they have many weapons, they would never be able to do without the sword, but those who have a sword can do without all the other weapons. It is also the most beautiful of the weapons, and the most beautiful of all the ornaments. It is suited for use in safe as well as scary places. It is also proper to be carried and girded on the waist. They also tell of the innate virtue of the sword, and to be proud of it thus. No one touches it but a clean person. That is to say an unclean person should not hold it without first cleansing himself. Also, it should not be shown to a woman who has a period. Its value should not be mentioned. No one should present a bare sword without the sheath to anyone. That is to say, they should not do such things out of respect and honor for the sword. It has been narrated that the angels pray for the person who is carrying the sword for the sake of God, the Most High, as long as the sword is on his neck. It has also been narrated that swords are the keys to paradise. It has also been narrated that God, the Most High, only appears to the angels with people who wear the swords for his sake. It has also been narrated that uh, God will decorate with the robe of honor, the one who carries a sword for the sake of God on the day of resurrection, and God will abandon the one who draws the sword against God on the day of resurrection. The sword has many virtues, but in this book we only mentioned a portion of them, and we have not translated the rest, from Arabic into Turkish, because we said, let us not alter the words of the great people, but rather we said, let our book be honored with the words of those people. And that is that, you should choose and carry the eski, sword, among the types of the swords. But here eski does not mean old, but rather it means a noble, sharp sword. In the same way the Arab people say, farasun atikun. In this case, the horse is but a colt. It means a noble, good horse. Here also, seifun atikun means good, skillful sword. The sword that has noble characteristics is an eski sword, no matter when it was manufactured. Do not carry the Yengi sword. The Yengi means the opposite of Eski, that is to say, the one that does not have Eski characteristics, even if it was manufactured before the time of Ad, and that is that. Now Eski is divided into three parts. The best among these three types of swords is the Yaman farce. After that it is Kali sword, after it the third one is the Hindi sword. But the Yengi sword is the most ominous of all the swords, it is called Muhdas in the Arabic language. The sword that is not Atik or Muhtas is called Mutavasit. This sword is manufactured in the country of Yaman out of iron from Baalman or Ceylon. But the damascening of the Yamani sword is streaked, and its knots are equal. Some of its knots are not bigger than others. But some of the swords are white damascened, and the background surface of some of them is red, and some of them is green. Close to its hilt there are white traces that resemble worms. They are like the whiteness of silver you might think that they were following each other. And know that the sign of the Eski sword that was manufactured in Kahaliat, that is to say, the good sword is this, that it has two holes on its tip of the hilt. Diameter of the holes are equal on each side, but center of the holes is narrow. 
and some of its characteristics are that it should have four saps, that is to say engraved places curved like a groove. It should be engraved concavely with a file, and some of them should be grooved three times. One of them is in the center and two of them are on the cutting edges. Most of these swords are two and a half fingers wide. They are light weight. Some of them are called kabur. These are more than two batmans. The kaburi sword, which is light, is plain. It has no engraved grooves. In length, it varies between three and four spans, closer to four spans. The broad sword is three and a half spans long. Its weight is from two and a half batmans to three batmans or less. But as for that sword that is three batmans or less, that sword quivers and bends much. Most of the Yamani swords are not free from veins. Many illustrations and prayers are written on those veins, so that those veins may not to be seen. Every writing that you see on a sword that is written diagonally more than four fingers away from its hilt, that script is written because of a crack on the blade. Whether you see a thick or a fine script, it is because of the veins. If you see a man's image that is written with genuine gold, it is because of a fault of the sword. It is called kabaki in their language. Sooner or later that sword gets broken in that place. If you see an image resembling children, and if it gets reddish after a while, this does not happen except on a Yamanur Eski sword or a Kabur sword. Do not strike with those swords in cold weather as it is terrifying. The Erklig sword, that is to say the sword with veins, does not have this sign, unless at the time of tempering the medicine that is applied to the sword, mixes well with the iron. But if the sword has Uruk, that is to say veins, it does not happen unless, when the medicine is applied, it does not mix with it well, and its veins remain soft. If these veins come to the cutting edge of the sword, it does not cut when you strike, but is thrown back. But some that seem to be veins are not veins. They happen in the time of tempering because of water. Water penetrates into those places and resemble veins. Know that these veins do not harm the sword, unless they are on the cutting edge and unless the sword does not absorb water at the time of tempering. No matter how much you strike with that kind of sword, it does not cut. Some of the Yamani swords are tempered at the side of the guard, and some of them are tempered on the forepart. These do not have these type of joints, unless they are of a bad kind of iron. Ah! Many swords are manufactured in Yaman that have many small grooves in their sides. But that sword that has one sat B that is to say grooved place, the rest being plain, its length is either a little more or a little less than four spans, that is to say it is not much. And its width is four fingers, nothing else. But the weight of the Yaman sword is never a full three Batmans. And only God knows the truth better. A chapter on the Kill All Swords. This chapter relates the Kill All Swords. Know that the Kill All Sword is not four or a full three fingers in width, but its length is between four and five spans, and its blade is straight. Its upper end is like its lower end. Downward from its hilt toward its point, it is thinner and wider than the Yaman sword, and its iron is white as silver. A chapter on the Indian swords. This chapter relates the Indian swords. The substance of the Indian sword resembles the substance of the Yaman sword, but the substance of the Indian sword is black, and if you break it, its broken part looks blackish. It is useful only for hanging on the neck of a woman who cannot give birth to a son. That sword should come from Khorasan. A chapter on the European swords. This chapter relates the European swords. The European sword is flat towards its hilt. Its point is thin. It is as thin as an Eski Yaman sword. In its center there is a wide strip engraved like a groove. And some of them have a groove like a moon or a golden cross engraved at the upper part of the sword. Some of them have a golden nail. Some of them have a mark at the side of that long strip, but the point of this sword is thinner than the Yamana sword. And that is that. Suleimani swords. The Yangi Suleiman sword resembles the European sword, but it is a little bit smaller and more beautiful than that. Its workmanship is more remarkable than that. Its upper and lower ends are the same. That is to say, its point is not narrow and it does not have an image or cross on it. The hilt of this resembles the hilt of the Yaman sword. The hilt of the European sword is also like this, but the hilt of the European sword is a little bigger, but its significance is Sava. That is to say, it is equal and only God knows. Damascus Swords The Damascus sword is sharp if it is tempered with its first water, but its blade is long and its substance varies. Its length is four spans and its width is a little bit less than four fingers. Ninety-two or but the Damascus sword is sharper than all of the Yengi swords. Egyptian Swords 
The Egyptian sword is long and the surface of its blade is smooth. It is strong. But know that the sharpness of all the swords is not because of their substance, but because of their workmanship and their shape. If the back of the sword is straight and its edges are equal, its thickness is even everywhere, and some parts of it are not hollowed out, and some parts do not protrude, and some parts of it are not thick, and some parts are not thin, and if its blade is thick, and if its cutting edge is thick, provided that its thickness is not more than a single hair, that sword is very sharp. Yet a sword that is sharp against the flesh and cloth and skin must have a thin edge, and that sword is not the one that is praised, because if it strikes against a hard object, it bends, it bends double. Tempering the sword moderately improves its sharpness. If its tempering is hard, it gets notched upon striking. If it is soft, it is thrown back. The striking part of the sword is one span away from its hilt. Some people say that. When a sword is manufactured, it has a smell. If it resembles cow urine or the smell of a frog or the smell of clay or the smell of a dog, then this sword is good. But as for those swords, the scents of which are like the smell of a tortoise or the smell of blood, those are the worst of the worst swords. And some people said thus, the sword moans only once, its voice is heard thus, and that is when its possessor dies, and when it comes out from its sheath, and when the war starts. Know that they said, a horseman's carrying a short sword against his opponent has many virtues. One of them is that the horseman must carry a good and light weapon, that being whatever he is able to carry and can use. Otherwise he never benefits from it, in other words it is no use to him. So it is with the sword. If it is not light in the hand of its possessor so that he is able to use it, when he strikes it, the sword will shake his hand, his shoulder blade will be jarred and he will lose the grip of its hilt. If the horseman is defeated in this way, he cannot use his sword at all, but rather his sword will fall down and that is that. The horseman carries his sword either by tying it on his waist or by making a cross shoulder strap and putting it on his neck. Both of these are proper. Then if it the strap is short, he will lengthen it. If it is long, he will shorten it. It is necessary that the cross shoulder strap have a strong belt and he should tie it on his waist so that in time of combat it will not leave the waist of the horseman. But it is stronger and more secure for the possessor to tie it on the waist than to make a cross shoulder strap. But when walking on foot, it is a little uncomfortable. And it is necessary also that the hilt of the sword will be squared instead of rounded so that upon striking it will not turn inside the hand. Also, when you grasp it, your fingers should touch each other. It is necessary that the pin of the hilt be strong. Also, the sword must be free in its sheath in the winter and in the summer, so that it will release from the sheath when you need it. It is necessary that you first learn how to release the sword smoothly from its sheath, then you learn how to return your sword after you strike. When you wish to draw your sword, put your left hand between the hilt and your thigh and draw your sword over the back of your left hand while holding the bridle reins with your left hand. Then you will be free from holding the sheath with your left hand. Putting your left hand on its belt and drawing it is as such. When you wish to return it into its sheath, put your left hand exactly where you put it when you drew your sword. Then put the edge of the back of the sword on the mouth of its sheath and pull it until its point falls into the sheath. Then pushing it down a little bit, put it into its sheath. It has an elegant device that they make on the mouth of the sheath. The upper side of the mouth of the sheath is cut and it is notched a little bit, until its upper side becomes one or two fingers shorter than its lower side. If you put the edge of the sword in it and pull it, when it reaches that place, the point of the sword will fall in it, and there will be no mistake. Also, know that the possessor of the sword needs to hit the ball with the polo stick on horseback, because that practice makes him skillful in that and relaxes his muscles. I have seen many people who would strike with their swords in the hippodromes and other safe places, and they were able to use the sword, but in time of combat they would strike the knees of their horses, or their ears and feet, or they would strike and cut their own feet. There is no weapon from which its possessor must protect himself more than the sword. Its possessor must protect himself very well from it. When you wish to learn to strike with the sword on horseback, obtain a freshly picked reed, or a thin fresh branch, whose length should be about the height of the horseman. Then stick it, the reed on the ground, somewhere, so that it will never move. After that, ride away from it in such a way that when you return, it is on your right. Then ride your horse in the same way that you ride when you shoot an arrow. When you approach it and reach its side, 
draw your sword from its sheath with a beautiful movement. Raise it the sword to the level of your right shoulder. Strike that reed or branch and cut it off. It is necessary that your drawing of the sword be simultaneous with your striking with skill. Do it many times so that you will get the habit of it. Every time cut one span of it the reed, until there remains only one arshan of reed above the ground. You should practice in such a way that you will master it completely, and you should learn to strike so that it will be easy. Then stick five arrows in the ground on the right side. The distance between each arrow should be ten arshans. Ride your horse fast and strike and cut all those arrows below the feathers at the same level in such a way that no arrow will be taller than the others. Use a thin-edged, sharp sword for this. Practice this until cutting these on horseback is easy for you. When you become skilled at this, and cut those arrows with ease, then also stick five arrows in the ground on the left side. Then, riding your horse fast, come between them and move through them, and cut them in the right and in the left. If you wish to add to these, increase them as much as you wish. When you wish to use the sword in the hippodromes or in time of combat, put your feet forward in the stirrup, so that none of your toes will be seen out of the iron of the stirrup. When you strike the sword, strike bending your ankle outward, and beware of yourself and your horse. When your blow comes from the direction of your face, at that time beware of your feet and your horse and your horse's head. When you become skillful at it and it becomes second nature to you, then start striking in front of the breast strap of your horse. After that, strike also on your left, strike in every direction. Start striking in front of your feet and behind your feet. Do this because a weak man loses his confidence but a strong man does not. Ended with the help of God. And that is that. The fifth skill, archery. If one learns it with a weak bow, he should also draw the same amount with a strong bow, so that he will learn it like the other one. Then he should also practice with arrows at the butt. First with a weak bow, and then with a strong bow until he learns it fully well. Then go out to an open field and practice very hard shooting at a target. Shoot much until you shoot as well as you do at the butt, but be careful not to lose your accurate shooting. The worst thing is to try to shoot as well as your previous shot. If you do, then you will lose your accurate shooting. So you must not desire to shoot as well as your previous shot, but rather you should seek to better your shooting. Hey, but the bow of the archer should be in accordance with his strength, so that he will be able to use his bow, and it is also necessary that his arrows will be in accordance with his bow in length. The bow should also be in accordance with the arrow. The length of the arrow is from one tip of the bow to the other, with the exception of the grip. If the arrow is longer than the bow, the archer suffers, and many faults become apparent. If the bow is longer than the arrow, according to the measurement that I have told you, the arrow will fall off the grip before the bow is fully drawn, and so the archer will not be able to draw it properly. His draw will look bad. Know that the length of the arrow should be as long as the arm of the archer, and is as long as the length which the archer is able to draw. The bow must be as long as the arrow. One should know the length of the arrow first, and then obtain a bow according to that. The grip of the bow must be eight fingers long. This grip length is better than all the others. The thickness of the grip should be in accordance with the grasp of its owner. If it is too thin, he should wrap something around it. In this subject there are many things to be said. We have mentioned only what was necessary, and have not mentioned the rest, saying that in this chapter this much is sufficient, saying let our book be not too long so that the one who reads it will not be distressed. We have abridged some of its excesses, and only God knows better. A chapter on the quality of the bow with which one aims at high burkas and shoots at fortresses and at something that overlooks. This chapter relates the quality of a bow that is used for shooting at people in high places and fortresses. Such a bow should have a longer upper limb and tip than the necessary length, so that when it shoots at a high place from a lower ground, the strength of the lower limb will be more when the arrow is loosed. The bow with which you shoot down from a high place should have a shorter upper limb and tip. All the other bows should have both limbs equal, but the upper limbs and tips of the ordinary bows should always be longer than their lower limbs and tips. The arrow pass should be at the halfway point of the bow equally. The knocking point on the string should also be like this equally. And that is that. A chapter on the arrow. This chapter relates the arrow. The expert archers have differed on the qualities of the arrow. Some of them said that the long arrow is good and some have preferred the short arrow. But they all have claimed that the long arrow leaves the bow more slowly, and the short arrow leaves the bow more quickly. They have claimed as such. 
and that is that. A chapter on attacking fortresses. During a war, if you wish to shoot at those in a fortress while standing at the base, you should stay under your shield and then draw the bow. When you bring the bow to full draw, raise your hands upwards, aim at your opponent and then shoot. And that is that. A chapter on shooting in war from the top of a fortress. At the people who are at the base of the fortress. <laughs> if you wish to shoot from the top of a fortress at the people who are at the base of the fortress, follow your opponent closely. Move the lower tip of the bow over to your right side. Hold the bow across and draw it downwards. Bend your back a little. Hold the arrow that is drawn in the bow between your two legs and shoot it. Beware not to shoot from one place in a war, but rather walk from one place to another. Watch your opponent and then shoot. And that is that. A chapter on drawing the bow. This chapter relates how to draw the bow. The principle of drawing the bow is that you should draw it to your eyebrow and you should pass your index finger over your mustache because the master archers have recommended it as such. You should draw the strong bow to your mustache and hold it on that anchor point. When you draw, you should not raise your hand upwards. Let it also be known that the waiting time when the bow is at full draw is to count until five. You should pause for a count of five. Some of the expert archers said that you should hold and then release the arrow before your face and eyes turn red. Minimum waiting time at the full draw position is to count until three, but the best way is to remain silent until counting three and shoot it. And that is that. A chapter on shooting short arrows with a guide. This chapter relates how to shoot short arrows through the hollow of a guide. This is a good skill to shoot at the people in high fortresses and the people who are far away and for many other things. Because an arrow like this travels a long distance, it travels about 1,000 arshans, and even more, they say. The length of an arrow to be used with a navak, arrow guide, is one span, and the length of its head is four fingers. They also shoot this arrow in Khorasan, and they call it aus, in their language there. Its head is smaller than a nail. The arrow guide is also called nazil. The arrow guide is made out of many things. It is made out of a thin reed, a Persian reed or a willow tree and light and soft trees similar to these. It should be thicker than a whip. Its length should be as long as the length of the ordinary arrow or two fingers longer than that. Open it from its one side as much as one third of it. Both its sides should bend inwards so that it will not allow the arrow to go out. Then put a leather band on it and put it on your finger. Then put the arrow inside the guide and knock. Draw it as you draw an arrow in the bow. When you draw it, hold your wrist, upper arm, and lower arm straight, as if all of them are one bone. When you are shooting the first arrow, pause a little while your hand is over your shoulder, then shoot. After that, do not pause. The Muslims have invented the arrow shot through the hollow of a guide. It has a strange story. It has been said that a person called Tabari had related it, and that is that. A chapter on shooting arrows from on top of a galloping horse. It has various graces. This chapter relates how to shoot arrows on horseback. It has many graceful things. It is necessary that you should have a proper horse. I have described before the horse that is good for shooting. When you wish to start shooting arrows on horseback while riding, you should take a weak bow and arrows which are good for this skill. Then erect five barkas that are following each other. The distance between each of them should be 40 arshans. Then take five arrows, ride your horse fast, and shoot these one after the other. When you become good at shooting at these, make the distance between them 30 arshans. Every time reduce the distance in between the barkas like that, until the distance is seven steps. When you also become skillful at this, try to shoot fast. This seven steps is the limit in this practice. Then erect them in another way. That is to say, three barkas on your left side and opposite to them, two barkas on your right side. Then ride your horse fast. Come and shoot first at the ones that are on your left side and then at the ones that are on your right, if you can. When you become skillful also at this, take a strong bow and shoot with it in the same way that you had done with a weak bow. Once you have perfected your accurate shooting, from then on, you will shoot accurately everywhere. That is to say, in the time of war, while shooting deer and in the hippodromes. From then on, you will not be afraid of shooting arrows. Then, erect ten barkas, five of them on your left and five of them on your right in various places. The distance between each of them should be in accordance with the limit that we had mentioned earlier. 
Take ten arrows that are suitable for this practice. Hold five of them together with the grip of the bow and insert the other five between the fingers of your right hand. When you finish shooting the arrows that were between your fingers, take the arrows next to the grip and insert them between your fingers, then shoot them as before. These arrows should be thin, so that they will fit between your fingers while you shoot, and only God knows better. The sixth skill concerns the game of polo. The sixth chapter relates what is necessary to play polo. Know that playing polo is one of the most beneficial skills of horsemanship. This skill playing polo is essential for whatever skill of horsemanship you wish to obtain especially for using the lance, sword, and arrow, that is to say in all these skills, because such things happen a lot in this game. Charging, snatching away the ball, turning, defending, running around, confronting each other, riding the horse and training the horse. In my opinion it happens in the training course, that is to say the horse and the horseman prepare for the war, they have a practice, and their hearts get accustomed to war. Because it is a beautiful game to watch, it is a serious practice for war. In addition it helps one not to lose his seat and to keep one's feet straight in the stirrups, that is to say to put one's feet well in the stirrups. This game is an art that the sultans and lords enjoy very much. It is also a gain for a horseman in his horsemanship. Let me describe to you those things that the horseman needs to know, that is to say, the skills of the horses, the art of the polo game, and the measurements of the polo field, and those situations in which hitting is not proper. When you exceed these, your stroke will be void. In this game, beware not to collide with another horse, and not to hit with the stick on the eye or on the face. In this game, these things are to be feared. Beware. A chapter which is more clear. This chapter relates how to hit the ball in the field. There are four types of hitting with a stick in the field. The first one that is well known and is used by everyone. It is hitting the ball straight forward on the right side, passing it the stick beside the right cheek of the horse. The second one is hitting the ball backward on the right side, passing it the stick beside the hindquarters and tail of the horse. The third one is hitting the ball straight forward on the left side, passing it the stick beside the left cheek of the horse. And the fourth one is hitting the ball backward on the left side, passing it the stick beside the hindquarters and the tail of the horse. There are many strokes other than these that are not to be counted. Some of those are done below the four feet of the horse, below its belly, its hooves, and other strokes that are not to be accounted. We have mentioned only some of them. Whoever wishes finds out about the others, if God, the Most High, so wills. In the first type, in order to have a good stroke, one should hit the ball with the stick straight forward, swinging his hand together with the stick, he should bring it over to his left shoulder. In the second type, a good stroke is this, that one should swing the stick backward, stretching it near the right ear of the horse, and passing it beside its tail without hitting the ear. In the third type of stroke, one should hit the ball forward with the stick by stretching his hand on his left side. He should return his hand to his right towards his back. In the fourth type of stroke, one should hit the ball backward with the stick. He should swing his hand passing it beside the hindquarters and the tail of the horse. It is also necessary that in all these four types that we have explained, the swing of your hand together with the stick should be over your head. When you hit the ball except when the area for you to turn is narrow, that is to say when there is a crowd, or one is afraid of hitting those who are around him with the stick, or when the horse passes it the ball quickly, or when the ball is in such a place that it is not possible to hit it hard. In such places if you do not hit the ball with a swing over your head, it is proper, that is to say, you should otherwise always hit it with a swing over your head. If one does not do it in the way that I have described, it is because of his bad stroke or his making a mistake in hitting the ball. When one is rolling or hitting the ball, one should always swing the stick on the same level as the stirrup or the girth. If one misses while he is rolling and hitting the ball, and if the ball is rolling over at his side he should try to strike it twice or three times beside the hindquarters and tail of the horse. Do it like that in all of those four types of stroke. These strokes are called musana, double, and musalas, triple. If he tries in this manner but is not able to hit the ball, it is because of his horses running too fast or the ball being in such a place in the field that he is not able to hit it as such. At that time, let him hit the ball in whatever way is possible, without losing his seat. Because losing one's seat is a grave mistake in the opinion of the horsemen. A chapter on the quality of the horses on which polo is played. This chapter relates the horses that are suitable for playing polo. 
the horse on which polo is played should be well-built and fast-breathing and mamunul akibatu. That is to say, its feet should be sound and its run should be swift. It should turn quickly when the rider wants to turn. It should stop immediately when its head is pulled by means of the bridle reins. Horses with these qualities are suitable for playing polo, and only God knows better. A chapter on the measurements of the stick. This chapter relates the measurements of the stick. The experts have unanimously stated that the length of the stick should be measured 19 grips with the grip of the person who is hitting with it. If it is more than that, it will not be easy for his arm. The shorter tick should be 17 grips with the grip of the possessor of the stick. If it is shorter than that, he who is hitting needs to bend down. When he bends down too much, he will lose his seat. It is a mistake. If the ball is a little away from you, it is also like this. Bending down when one is out of position, leaving one's upright sitting position, and losing one's seat while hitting the ball, all of these are grave mistakes. Yet stretching out one's hand, bending down one's waist while holding the stick without moving one's bottom out of the saddle, all of these are not mistakes. If one moves his bottom out of the saddle, then it is a mistake. The longer stick is stronger, if it is not so long that it will prevent one from hitting the ball. The heavy stick should be 55 miscalls. If it is heavier than that, it will be too heavy to hit the ball. It will not be easy, unless the possessor of the stick is even stronger. The light one should be 40 miscalls. If it is less than that, it will shake in one's hand. One will not be able to hit the ball, unless the possessor of the stick is even weaker. Between the heavy and the light ones, whatever is appropriate to its possessor, he should take that. The length of the stick is in accordance with the height of its possessor and the horse. He should have a stick in accordance with his height, because the experts had mentioned it as such. We also mentioned it so that you will know about it. And that is that. A chapter on the misurements of the polo field. This chapter relates the measurements of the polo fields. The better one is the medium size field. Its length should be 1,000 arshins long, its width should also be the same. Any field which is more or less the same in length and width is a good field. It is necessary that its ground should be absolutely flat, and only God knows the truth better. A chapter on the number of players in the game of polo. And this chapter relates how many players are good for playing polo. A good number for the polo game is 10, that is to say that the minimum number is 10. If it is more than that, it is also proper. Each of these two groups needs a leader and another player is needed to back him up so that when he, the leader, makes a mistake, he, the second player, will help him out. The remaining players should play in the middle and these are five. That group should be made up of five people. If they are more than that, it is proper, unless they are less, and that is that. A chapter on the art of hitting with a spear. This chapter relates the art of hitting with a spear. The art of hitting with a spear is as follows. One should hold the spear in the middle backwards upside down. Then he should shake it three times, take three steps forward, and staying sideways towards the place where he intends to throw, he should throw it at his opponent with all of his strength. He should strive to hit him. Thanks to the only God, and God prayed for our master Muhammad and his family and his friends in the year 850 after the Hijra of the Prophet, God prayed for him, 